It's Tuesday, November 7th, and you're listening to the Beer Temple Podcast. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard and seen from again, 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 again. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard and seen from again, 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 again. Temple that's, podcast. That's the new point. Yeah, perfect fade from the from the fade master. Uh, I, I think people can tell just from the from the get go. You know who's who's on the ones and twos back right. there. Um, I'm your host Chris Quinn, joined by your other host Mike Shalau. Hello, We're coming to you from Beer Temple. Uh, we've got uh, yeah a fun show lined up. But before we get into it, just wanted to give the the normal thanks. Thanks to Lumpin' Radio for having us on. Thanks to the fearless leaders over there. And to all you folks who listen uh, via the airwaves on 105.5 FM. And to the majority of you who are listening via podcast, wherever you get your, your podcasts. Um, and thanks for the reviews and all sorts of stuff like that. Although... To be fair, we only really look at the ones on Apple. Have you ever looked at them anywhere else? Oh, I, never I didn't have. even know there were other reviews. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and there might not be, frankly. So we'll see. But thank you nonetheless. Yeah. I'm, and uh, if you know how to get to reviews on other podcasting yeah. platforms, let us know. And the handwritten letters have started to trickle back in. So hey, hey. there we go. Those are the, the true reviews. Yeah, the true ones. The only ones we care about. Right. You take the so, time to handwrite a letter. And write uh, postcards have been popular lately. Nice. So yes. What's up with you, man? How you been? Good. Uh, didn't go to Fobab this weekend, but Neither spent did I. time with people who were in town for Fobab. Got it. Well, and people who were in town happenstantially around Fobab. Will from uh, and Ashley from Lesser Known were here a bunch. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great Brewery in Winston Salem. Rob got, from uh, Supermoon was in town. I didn't see him. Yeah. Well, I do love Rob. Yeah. Uh, and then my friend Moreg. Who, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say the brewery she is working at now, but <laughs> she worked with me at Pipeworks and is working on a new project and making sake. And oh, fun. so I spent most of that weekend having drinks with people who didn't want to have any beer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Yeah, I uh, it's been a few years off for for Fobab for me, and uh, yeah. you and I, I think, or probably we judged the last time that either of us were there. Perhaps. I went last year because oh. we entered beer. But okay. I didn't judge last year. Okay. Did you, uh, we've got uh, a fun lo- panel uh, lined up. Zoom, uh, crashed. zoom just crashed. Oh, oh, oh. Chris knows he needs hey. to Okay, back. there we go. <laughs> nice. You're back. All what right. What happened? Uh, <laughs> man, you missed it. It was awesome. So probably our best episode. Yeah. So that's oh, it. No, so we're going to wrap it up. You had time to get your pants back on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. We were just uh, actually, it's good timing. We're just about to introduce <laughs> our guests. We've got a we've got a, uh, a a dedicated kind of topic, which we've been doing mm-hmm. a little bit more of. Yeah. Um, and this one was exciting for me uh, personally. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about specifically West Coast beers and really West Coast IPAs, mm-hmm. which are you know near and dear to my heart. Mm-hmm. But let's introduce the guests the way we always do: order of seniority. Seniority being how many times you've been on this show, which is the only seniority we care about. <laughs> so, uh, the legendary West Coast brewer, uh, Jude LaRose of uh, Hot Butcher here in Chicago. What's up, man? I think it's how the first are? time that I've gotten uh, seniority, and I've right. gotten to go first. Nice. So oh, that's nice. pretty cool. What's up with you, man? Um, stoked to be here. Stoked to be on this podcast with the three of you. Stoked to be on this podcast with the two of you. Um, we uh, we're celebrating the one year anniversary of the tap room being open. So, you know, we'll be a brewery for nine years in March or sold our first beer yeah, for nine wow. years in March. But one year ago, you know, next week. So we got some fun things planned. We got our first barrel age can release coming up. We got our first actual DDH beer where we actually 
really? PDH to beer. After all this time. After That's all this amazing. Time. Yeah. Usually just four pounds per barrel, four and a half pounds per barrel, but this time took a 3.6 pound per barrel beer, moved it up to 7.2 with some okay. Citra and Citra Cryo. I've heard of those. Yeah. So stoked, <laughs> stoked for that and left it cold for like, because we didn't re- need to release it, left it cold for like two weeks, three weeks. When is that coming out? Comes out Thursday. What's it called? It's called DDH Snorkel. DDH Snorkel Squad. All right. So it's a first. So nice. we got a bunch of those well, things congrats. happening. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, your crew was in here yesterday. Yes, they were yeah. ripping it up, having a good good old time here. Saw some pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for coming on, man. So excited. Here. Um, no, we we have some folks from the West Coast, but we, we need to have someone who uh, can maybe speak their language. I know you are a brewer, Mike, <laughs> but you're more of a an ester driven brewer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mike uses Columbus hot side in every <laughs> yeah, one of his right. songs. That is true actually. Is it true? <laughs> yeah, we better with Columbus. Yeah. Um yeah. So Columbus then Saison. we've we've got our, our next two uh guests. We'll just uh we'll go by order that they signed on to Zoom. Why not? Sure. Uh so the uh the tradition is that uh first time guests introduce themselves so uh, why don't uh, you start, uh, Julian? Why don't you introduce yourself and tell everyone who you are? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. It's an honor to be here, and I'm really happy to be chatting with everybody here. Uh, but my name is Julian Schrego. I'm the co-founder, co-owner, and brewmaster of Beachwood Brewing in California. Uh, we opened as a brewery business roughly 13 years ago, so been in the game professionally, professionally. Uh, just over a decade at this point. Awesome. That's awesome. Wow, a decade. Wow. So I think when I first had your beers, then you must have been brand spanking new because I think I first had Beachwood beers. Well, no, I guess it wasn't 13 years. It was at the um, the Shelton Brother uh, Fest in um, yeah. Long Beach. I, I think is where it was. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was in twenty I think that was in twenty thirteen or twenty fourteen. Okay. Okay. Um yes, you were I remember that was a older. that was a fantastic festival. We were kind of the hub for yeah. uh for that for that event. And I remember I was so fucking sick that week. I oh, got really? a really, really gnarly cold. Um, like maybe two days before the festival happened and we had scheduled a collab with the, the guys from uh, DeMolin. And I remember they showed up right. and I, I just felt like, like hammered shit. And I had to, I had to put on my game face and post them. And then I remember at one point um, I turned around and there were like 30 people in the brewery drinking <laughs> beers and hanging out and carousing and wanting to party. Anyway, yeah. Totally wanted to party, but Anyway, uh, Shelton Fest. Yeah, we were the hub for that. So Yeah, that was a good time. I remember that. The, the things I remember from that fest were your beers and also, after the fact, there was this beer called uh, Julius uh, that was getting poured out of a trash can. Uh, it was a, it was Wait, a, what? yeah, it was a, it was, it was a, a jockey box. Tiger. It was a jockey box. that was converted from a, from a trash can, like a big, like <laughs> outdoor trash can. And, um, I forget the <laughs> owner's name, but he was the one who was pouring it. And, uh, yeah, it was just there. I think it was the only beer they were pouring. Nathan. Maybe. Yeah. It was in a, tr- wait, in a trash can. Yeah. They filled it. Yeah. It they, was a makeshift jockey box. Yeah. I remember yeah. they were pouring next, next to our booth. And I, I vaguely remember that, but I, I remember having Julius. I didn't realize it was the owner. Uh, but yeah, that yeah. was Treehouse. Yeah. Yeah. That was the first time I'd, they were just starting to get a little bit of a, of a name back then. Um, mm-hmm. but the hype was, you know, not anywhere near what I mean, it would become later. Um, and then the other thing, so big enough to be at the Shelton sure, Fest. Sure, sure. Um, and then it was the first time I ever saw the flux capacitor, which I had read about and, and heard about. And I went to uh, Beachwood. I went there after, uh, afterwards I went to your, um, the barbecue, like your, your brew pub. And mm-hmm. I'd had a, b- a bunch, but I wanted to try more and it was on my way out. So I was there like, you know, by myself, had some food, um, drank alone as I, Always do, pretty much. That's why I started this podcast, so yeah, I'll have look, a reason like a not away to drink, when you drink. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, right. No, yeah, exactly. Look away. Um, yeah, and saw the the flux capacitor, uh, which was... Um, That's the like the 
the CO2 nitrogen blending. No, I think of... it's pressure and temperature, right? <clears throat> oh, is, is what it did. You no, know, it's 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 uh, gas mixture and dispensing pressure. Oh, well, so that is uh, the flux capacitor. The famed flux capacitor is this big fancy gas manifold that we have at um, at most of our locations, and that's my business partner Gabe's brainchild. But basically, what it is is it's uh, multiple manifolds of different gas mixtures, everything from uh, 55% CO2 up to 100% CO2 blended with nitrogen. Um, and then uh, what it allows you to do, there's a series of like jumper lines and you can select one of five gas mixtures for each beer individually. And then uh, we have a pressure regulator for each tap as well. So you can, you can pour any beer at the like, you can maintain the perfect carbonation. You can correct for carbonation issues. And if something comes in with really high carbonation, like a, like a great Belgian beer, you can, you can totally dispense it in a controlled way too. So, uh, it's just, it's full control for, for draft beer, individual line by line. Mm. I think I've seen it at Torst. Yeah. 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 Gabe built one for Torst. Nice. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I can think of some Belgian beers that we put on that uh could use a flux capacitor not the dull a... primarily yeah, yeah. the dull just i don't know what you're talking about yeah <laughs> yeah not, <laughs> definitely not your beers 100 uh well thanks uh again not uh anymore. julian um sure yeah it's awesome it's awesome to have you on and next uh our, our next guest why don't you go ahead and, and introduce yourself sean Hey guys, uh, my name is Sean McElhenney, co-owner, co-founder, head brewer for McElhenney Brewing Company. We have been open for just over two years now, uh, two years in May. I uh, took over our former brewery location here in Alpine uh, that was Alpine Beer Company that my dad founded way back in 1999. Awesome. Yeah, I just, I just got to the new space which is similar to the old space. Uh, this past this past summer, it was it was magical. It was um, it was awesome. I, I loved that it that it was. Well, I mean, it wasn't the same. It was a little different, but it was essentially it was the same. It was the same. It was awesome. <laughs> which I which I say in the best possible way. Vibes were immaculate. Yeah. Vibes were immaculate. Oh, speaking of vibes, we were there on um, St. Patrick's Day. So green, yeah. green Nelson. Yeah, a guy gets out of a car, out of his car randomly, and starts playing the bagpipes. And we thought that you guys had like hired him, and we're like, "Whoa, all right, cool." They hired a guy to just like stand, but he was standing in the parking lot. So we're like, "Is he gonna like walk in?" Uh, and he just is out in the parking lot, plays like two songs. And then like, rolls out. He's like, a, he's like a wandering minstrel bagpiper. Exactly. That's exactly what he was. Like, and the, the, the staff was like, you want to come in? Do you want a beer? Like, that was amazing. And he's like, no, I'm just rolling around. I'm a wandering minstrel bagpiper, essentially, <laughs> yeah. is what he said. That's and, awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sneak attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a blast. That was a lot wow. of fun. That's a magical experience. <laughs> yeah, right. I know. In the, in the warm California sun. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Uh, well, thanks to both of you for for coming on. Um, it's uh, I think, yeah, it, it's it's exciting. Yeah, um, what do you think, Jude? You're looking at me. I'm I'm just listening to you guys talk. I'm okay. super excited. We're gonna talk some West Coast IPA. Exactly. What makes it? What it is? What isn't? Where's it going? All that. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk to. Uh, well, it's great to have you two on because I think you your breweries make. Two of, I mean, some of the best uh, West Coast IPAs, I think, uh, in creation. Um, it's uh, certainly no, to anyone here uh, at, at who comes to Beer Nipple knows that I'm a, I'm a fanboy of uh, of Beechwood, and um, yeah, and, and I anyone mean, listens to the podcast knows you're right. a fan of uh, and <laughs> Alpine <laughs> slash Mickelhenny. I mean, we were talking about it when I was going to California. We were like, "What's number one on the list?" And I was like, "Well, it's got to. We got to check out this Mickelhenny place. See yeah. if it's what it's cracked up to be." And right. uh, yeah, and you know what? Surprise, surprise, they make pretty good beers, bagpipers and all, and, and the bagpipers. Yeah, <laughs> so. I think that my relationship with your two breweries, too, starts here at Beer Temple because I think it was around Fobab two years ago, three years ago, that you may have first brought in Amalgamator, right? 
Yeah. You bur- and then and then you just went nuts. Everybody went nuts here. And yeah. Kind of started a little revolution around getting that in fresh. And you yeah. kind of started like you did with a couple beers here, where people started getting in on it. Then everybody around the city started, you know, wanting to bring it in more. Yeah. And then I'll never forget too. We can never Alpine never distributed here. And then famously when they started, I had read. I'd watched a million videos of this of, of Alpine or of Nelson being made on YouTube <laughs> of you leading that that video, Sean. Um, yeah. But it was right around the Super Bowl, 2013 or 14, and I grabbed uh, like a like a bomber of Nelson or whatever that bottle was, and that yeah. was probably mm-hmm. the first time outside of like a Mickler Half Acre collab, which was like an India India Pale guess, Lager that had all lager. Nelson. Yeah, yeah. Guess Lager was so cool. Um, so my mind was blown at what Nelson was and what that was in that beer and that malt character. And that was like, whatever, Super Bowl, February one year. Yeah. So two magical mm-hmm. experiences and all those beers were brought here. Yeah. Rad. That's, that's awesome. That's, that's I don't, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know. What, I will say one thing that reminds me of is when Amalgamator came on and it's kind of like a good jumping off point for, for what we can start talking about is. Um, it, it, it had been like for a while we were getting like really fresh pre buyout um, ballast point. We were getting you know super fresh stone. We were getting um, green flash in, in really good condition. We were getting you know a bunch of really good uh, West Coast uh, breweries uh, and, and specifically um, Southern California um, IPAs. Um, but then that kind of dried up. And Amalgamator, I think, really blew people's minds when it came on because they'd had so many beers out here in Chicago. We get a ton of distribution out here. We get a ton. Yeah. And a lot of West Coast IPAs by style description, right? And people had it, and I was just like, right? Yeah, no, this is like the real thing. This isn't West Coast style. This is a West Coast IPA. And it like blew people's minds, like how just like, oh, right, right. And it was in the, the, the haze craze, you know, the, the, the peak of the haze craze. And um, it was awesome. So um, it, now I think West Coast is seeing, you know, well, it never really went away. But it's, it's becoming now, like I think probably perhaps the most popular style here in, in Chicago or, or among them. Um, and I just wanted to ask you guys, um, like, to, to you two, like, what is a West Coast IPA? Well, um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for, for sharing those, uh, those kind words. I really appreciate it. And, and it's awesome that you were able to curate that experience with your, your customers and your fans, uh, especially with uh, Amalgamator, that's uh, a very special beer for us at Beechwood. Uh, it was the first year-round uh, mosaic beer that we made. Uh, and um, it's it's one that's actually changed a little bit over the years and slightly evolved. And, and it's been uh, in a really good spot for a couple of years now. But uh, kind of getting back to your question, what is West Coast IPA? Well, I go around and when I travel, I have phenomenal beers in many different parts of the world, parts of the United States. But I find that the West Coast IPA that that I would truly consider West Coast IPA is so regionally defined. Um, I can go to Portland. I can go to Seattle and get fantastic IPAs, even things that are called West Coast IPA. But there are regional differences. So for me, West Coast IPA that suits my palate. It's almost exclusive to San Diego with a few outliers in Los Angeles. I could not agree more. Northern California now. What's that? I said I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, I originally oh, okay. grew up in Philadelphia, and before I came to um, Chicago, we would call them San Diego IPAs is what we would call them. And then it just kind of got lumped <laughs> into West Coast, and then I was – in the west, on the west coast, uh, twice this past summer, and I traveled up the coast, and you could see the IPAs changing as you went north. I mean, by the time you were in the central coast, they were, I feel, noticeably different than they were in San Diego. Um, and then when you went up into like Sonoma and stuff like that, they, you know, they were d- different again. I feel. Um, 
So um, it's uh, I'm glad to hear you say that they're so regional, almost to the, like the San Diego and kind of the uh, well, really your your area where uh, Beachwood and I think like uh, some of the others like Rip and um, mm -hmm. was it Green El Segundo Creek Cheek. and El Segundo, yeah, yeah. Um, but but yeah, after that they they start to change already. I felt, but anyway, I, I interrupt. They do you. and. It, no, it's okay. They, they, they do start to change and there's kind of, uh, like a, a regional, you know, circular influence that, that, you know, breweries close to one another will, will influence each other. And there's not a lot of cross pollination happening between breweries in Portland and breweries in San Diego, the way that there is cross pollination and influence happening within San Diego between San Diego breweries. But for me, West Coast IPA has to be very dry uh, relative to other IPAs. Uh, it has to have moderate to firm hop bitterness, and it has to have a lot of hop flavor and be incredibly aromatic. And for for us at Beachwood, we we essentially brew West Coast IPA and double IPA with base malt and nothing else. We don't put crystal malt in there uh, with very, very rare exception, um, but Amalgamator is just – it's our silo two row malt and it's focused on mosaic hops. I mean, those are the two main things that drive that beer and kind of what, what helped me arrive at that point was a beer that I had almost 20 years ago at uh, pizza port in uh, Solana beach when Tommy Arthur was still the head brewer there. And I had this double IPA called Lou P Lynn, you know, kind of a play on lupulin. And I, I know Sean remembers this beer totally because I, I know he drank beer ever. <laughs> one of one of the best beers ever. And so I was there, I was there with some friends and I saw the beer on the menu and I knew it was an IPA and something hoppy. I didn't realize it was a double IPA, but I ordered it and it was super pale. Like this is really pale. And I get it close to my face and I'm just overwhelmed by this amazing aroma. It was super dry. It was crazy flavorful, just blew me away. And then I saw Tommy at an event uh, a couple weeks later and I asked him about Lou P. Lynn. He, he said, Oh yeah, that's a double IPA. And I said, yeah, what malts did you use in it? And he said, um, just two row, just base malt right. and then some dextrose to, to dry it out. And I asked him, well, what crystal malt and specialty malt did you use in it? And he said, I didn't use any in it. And that blew my mind and really disabused me to this kind of old notion that you have to balance hops with crystal malt no you don't you don't have to do that at all and so, you can create so where do you think that came from beer what do you think that came from so you you naturally had that idea that you thought it's got to have this color to it this kind of like toothiness of, of flavor and, and malt character so you even went into it thinking it, it might have that where do you think that that notion was created. Uh, it it came. It came from old British brewing traditions, and and probably the first IPAs that that I drank uh, that that I really enjoyed. Um, uh, and and I think there was a there's a lot of stuff that's perpetuated in, in some home brewing literature out there that that you still see to this day that IPAs need to be balanced, and you need to balance hops with crystal malt. That you need sweetness to balance bitterness. And you really don't. There's so many other ways to dial in beers and, and balance flavors and, and create what you want. And crystal malt is not one of those things. But kind of my point with that is it forced me to rethink the style entirely and kind of tear up the blueprint for what I was doing at home as a home brewer at the time. And so it was not quite 20 years ago that I started brewing IPAs and double IPAs at home that had either no crystal malt or almost no crystal malt to them, but they were just basically one or two different types of base malt. And that was all that was there. And there was nothing interfering with the hops. And, um, you know, it was really kind of some of those San Diego IPAs uh, and double IPAs that, that set that influence for me that still carries through to this day. And another beer uh, that would be really important kind of around the same time is a beer that Jeff Bagby, was brewing called poor man's IPA. And that was actually a double IPA. Sean, I'm sure remembers that beer too. And how amazing that, that beer always was every time I had it. Sure. Uh, and also again, very dry, super aromatic, uh, dry hopped in the serving tank, which was something that like, I only really knew Pete support to do. Uh, and that's something that we at Beachwood still do with our double IPAs. They still get, 
dry hopped uh, in the bright tank with flowers and pellets, even at our production facility. My team hates it when I do that because right. they have to fully break down the tank every time. And when you're brewing a couple hundred barrels of double IPA, I mean, like, fuck, we gotta, we got to break this tank down again, stuff more hop sacks in there. But uh, the results are unique and, you know, you can't reproduce that any other way. That's true. How about you, Sean? Anything that you'd like to add to uh, what makes uh, a West Coast IPA uh, a, a West Coast IPA? I'm just kind of reiterating what Julian had to say. I mean, we're, we're talking about a decidedly bitter beer uh, that you're really trying to accentuate the hop character, right? Malt is basically an afterthought. That's where we're getting the alcohol, you know. Uh, and, and at that point, it's... How crazy can you get with the dry hopping techniques? How can mm-hmm. you find new ways to add the hops uh, and create these these explosive flavors and aromas, um, and still creating that that balance that we're looking for? You know. So I heard uh, Pizza Port, which is um, it, it's like I don't know. To me, like when I I go to San Diego, it tends to be the first place I go to, just because it seems. I don't know. To me, it's like what I associate um, Southern California IPA or or even hoppy beers because they make pay. I mean, they make a ton of beers, frankly. I mean, they're a pretty well-rounded brew pub, Um, but they're they're pale, they're IPAs and and stuff like that. Um, To me, it's kind of like the quintessential, but I'm curious to you, like, is there a – is there a – a single like starting point, like a, a, is there a quintessential uh, West Coast IPA? Um, and is there like, you guys, is there yeah. one that was like, oh, this is a brand new paradigm or is it just slowly shifted into the things you guys have described over the last, you know, 20 years? Right. Well, the, the, for me, the two, the two beers that I cited were, were, two, they still have influence on me to this day, but Lou P. Lynn and then Poor Man's IPA. And then another beer that still has tremendous memory uh, and influence for me, probably the first IPA that I had that had a level of intensity that blew me away was um, Anderson Valley Hop Otten IPA when I had that in the mid-90s. Oh, yeah. There really wasn't anything else on the market quite that intense. And uh, a lot of people make note of Beechwood's IPAs being 7.1%. And that's kind of our sweet spot for West Coast IPA. But that came from somewhere. And uh, I remember the first time I had Anderson Valley Hop Otten IPA, I was like, holy shit, this is super intense, really flavorful. It's saturating my palate. It's got tons of aroma. There is a crystal malt component to that beer, but it was also the 90s. Um, So that was, you know, that wasn't something that had been dispensed with in IPA brewing at the time. But um, I remember looking at the side of the label and it said 7% ABV and that was quite a bit higher than any other uh, India pale yeah. ale on the market. And it just made me think, okay, that's, that's what I'm enjoying in this beer is the intensity. And that's one thing I think is very unique to West coast IPA is it is in a lot of ways, the only beer that has that level of, um, hop flavor intensity aromatic intensity and that level of drinkability it's almost kind of the only beer that checks all those boxes quite that way there's certainly some pilsners out there and other highly hopped uh lighter styles that that are very drinkable um but west coast ipa is uniquely intense and uniquely drinkable pint after pint yeah we've said uh mike and i have have this kind of theory Mm -hmm. that the sweet spot for like the best ipas is like seven to like seven and a half seven, percent. Yeah. Like we've seven, just found time and again. Like, seven one seven four is the real tight range. Yeah, if you want to be right. weird. It's about like it. it's like <laughs> it's like there's something about that level of alcohol that yeah. just brings out I, the, that those hop characteristics. Or, I basically drink nothing totally. above like five and a half percent. Yeah, me except either. for like hoppy beers in the seven to seven one seven four right. range. Maybe it's a, not in there. Maybe, maybe a Belgian. Yeah, maybe. Every once in a, yeah um, right. Yeah. Speaking of, I'm going to undress an IPA that I've been keeping cold here, so I've got to enter a couple koozies. And of course, I found oh, a go. Mount Baldy koozie when I was when I was running on Mount Baldy. Nice. Um, and then 
Here we go, Bud Light. No, it's not really Bud Light. <laughs> yeah, it they is can't a, see you. To be released uh, collab that we did with Fremont Brewing called oh, nice. Title Track. Cool. Yeah. And speaking of kind of regional differences and sensibilities, uh, Fremont uh, brews a lot of what they describe as West Coast IPAs, and they make amazing beers. I love visiting Fremont Brewing, especially every time I go into uh, Seattle. Uh, I always make sure to stop there. And when we first started talking about the recipe for this beer, one of uh, one of the things that came up uh, was, do we want to use any kind of Vienna malt, crystal malt, Munich malt in the base? And we decided ultimately, no, we just want to skew this really pale, and it's just our silo two-row malt that's in here. We focused on the hops entirely. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to crack this open. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got my... Signature Beachwood glass here. That's not a plug. Yeah, right. It's okay. This is audio only, so. <laughs> exactly. And, oh, it's too bad. This is really, really pale in color and super bright. You can see through it, unfortunately. Right. Oh, so well. I did notice that. Did the, did the hazy um, craze, did it, did it hit as hard on the West Coast as it did everywhere else in the country, it, it seems? Because sure when I... Time. It did. Oh yeah. Okay. Whoa, my team did a really good job with this. I haven't had this yet. <laughs> yeah. No plug. Look at look at this guy. Always selling, right? Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, cool. hats off to my team. I didn't I didn't touch that beer. I was all <laughs> everybody else's hands. Um. And and what is the? I mean, is there a sense of like, um, hometown, uh, stylistic pride to uh to the the, the clear light uh, hoppy beers or. Did uh, everyone kind of just love uh, those kind of juicy, hazy uh, New England styles uh, as much in Southern California as uh, everywhere else? They seem to have a lot of popularity in Southern California, and that seems to have sustained uh, since since their inception. I, I don't think I've seen the popularity of those decline. It was it was a little shocking to me as a as a technical brewer. Um uh, when those styles started gaining popularity and I was really resistant to, to brewing one. And uh, I, I kind of had to just surrender my ego at one point and realize that our fans and customers are asking us to brew one of these, not because they want us to jump on the bandwagon, but because they think that we'll be good at it. And I really kind of owe it to my fans and customers who support my business to take a stab at this. And so we did, I want to say it was about eight years ago, we brewed a we brewed a hazy called Twenty Eight Haze Later, and and that ended up becoming our flagship year round hazy IPA. And uh, it's yeah, it's something that we brew regularly. It's always in the tank. It's not a huge percentage of um, our total annual production. I, I'd say annually we're still about seventy percent West Coast IPA as a company, as a brewing company. Okay. So we're still very heavily skewed towards West Coast. How about you, Sean? You guys uh making uh hazy IPAs as well? We do not do a hazy IPA. Uh we do an unfiltered uh it unfiltered IPA. Uh it is my ode to Nelson. Uh, it's a beer called Months. Yep. It is a blend of Nelson Savin and Necron hops, and it's got about 20% rye in the grist, and uh, it is completely unfiltered. So, yes, it does have a level of haze to it, but it's because of the water profile and the hop additions, it is a West Coast IPA. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've just, had that beer, and I would not consider that to be a what, New England style. Yeah, that beer is so that yeah. beer is so good, Sean. The first time I had months was when you and your dad uh, did that kind of side chat at the uh, C- at that Southern California Brewers Conference. I think it was two years ago or something, and yeah. it totally brought me back to the uh, the first batches of Nelson when your dad was still hauling Nelson hops over in, in suitcases from New Zealand. <laughs> right. Yep. He yeah. was very fortunate to have found those hops over there in New Zealand uh, so many years ago. Yeah. And I think it's important to note, I'm going to go ahead and call it right now, but I'm going to say that, that, uh, that Sean, you and your dad deserve the credit for, for bringing that hop to the United States and helping it get traction. Uh, I, oh, it was all my dad. I mean, you guys were you, okay. Well, then, then we'll give credit to your dad. Okay, absolutely. Uh, 
so he's uh he i mean he was using it for for years before anybody else brought I mean, he was am i correct in saying that he would fly there and he would bring it back in his suitcase like enough to brew a couple batches <laughs> No, it wasn't like that. But uh, in 2003, okay. <laughs> he and my mom were having their 25th wedding anniversary vacation. Uh, they went over to New Zealand for the better part of a month. And while driving along the roadside, they saw hops growing and made it a point to track them down, find out where they were selling them, where they were, what they were doing with them. Uh, made friends with the then owner of New Zealand Hops Limited and... Uh, guy liked what my dad had to say, liked his attitude, liked what he wanted to do with the hops. And uh, it took about a year and a half or so to actually get the hops from New Zealand. So they landed on the Long Beach Customs. Uh, and it took about two months after sitting on the Customs, uh, wherever they check them in at, uh, before we actually were able to procure them and i think it was 2005 was the first time he brewed a golden rye ipa with nelson Sauvin and southern cross hops and that mm. was wow okay nice that's it's crazy um, i yeah. love that story i love I, it yeah my, my favorite ipa of all all time yeah. i mean i remember going to alpine and um you know it doesn't happen that often it happened you know earlier in your beer drinking career it happens more where you're just like taken aback and like blown away by how different something is and i'd heard about this beer you know alpine and 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 stuff like that and uh it was yeah it i just remember trying to buy yeah as much as i could and and that and and duet and um Happy birthday. Pure happy birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pure happy happiness. birthday. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. And then I, I ended up going to, um, uh, um, Vermont and Sean Hill is pretty famously curmudgeonly about people who drop off beer there and, uh, it, very flippant, uh, about, about that sort of stuff. I mean, has been, he's kind of whatever he knows he is, whatever I would, I would tell him. Does he listen to this podcast? He has in the past because he's he's, oh. he's texted me about it. If okay. I say something he doesn't like, um, which so maybe I'll get it. But I, I gave him a tell bottle of duet and I think Alpine, and you. then I went home and he he reached out to me. He was like, "Hey, that Alpine stuff was really exceptionally good." So uh, yeah, so that was I was like, "Oh, he must have really liked it if he wanted to to reach out." And I was like, "All right, good. I've got I've got good taste. Nice. All right, if, yeah." He liked it so much that we were actually able to start trading uh, six tools back and forth. We had a guy yeah. that was driving from San Diego over to Vermont and Jesus. was willing to mule the kegs and would bring stuff like Edward or, you know, some of their right. other hoppy awesome goodness. Yeah, uh, right. The Heady Topper from the Alchemist. And, it's a uh, nice it connect great. to have somebody who's going to mule awesome. that. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that's fun. Every time we tried to send it by mail, the keg would get there, uh, you know, labeling it as farm equipment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turns out that didn't work. Get all the way to Vermont <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> they, they checked the contents of the package we sent and uh, sent it all the way back. Yeah. Oh, wow. They had a coupler. Right. <laughs> exactly. Sent, back sent it back empty. Yeah. Oh, that's worse. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, yeah. what is the water profile look like for your quintessential kind of west coast ipa build uh we go very ahead. hard so for yeah well there you go sean well our we're probably not as hard as sean but you know few people are uh, but <laughs> sean if you want to talk about your water profile first go for it let's hear it we have a proprietary water supply here in Alpine that we don't really talk too much about, but uh, it does have good minerality. It is very hard. It is perfectly well suited for brewing hop accentuated beers in particular. Um, and through that, uh, you know, we have to, we have to treat it when we want to get into the lagers or anything other than the uh, hoppy beer styles. So, all right. Wait, so when you naturally say you have, burtonized. So, okay. When you say you have a proprietary yeah, water source, alpine. Is that the entire town, or just yeah, your, right. the brewery as a proprietary? Right. It's water. The, it's the, are you guys yes. on well water up there? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Well, there's, there's so, three the questions asked. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. So we've even given so. the water reports to uh, other brewers who want to try to replicate, you know, the styles of beers that we are brewing, and that. Uh, 
they can get close, but they'll never yes. replicate Can completely. LOL what? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so for, for us at Beechwood, um, our water is actually pretty pretty consistent. And even even in years when there's a drought or even last year when there was a lot of record rainfall, um, our local water supply does a good job of keeping the, the mineral content pretty consistent. Um, I'd say since we since we opened our production facility, I haven't seen any of those like key ions that people call. I haven't seen those fluctuate more than 10 percent in in uh, almost eight years. It, but our water is fairly easy to deal with. It doesn't have a ton of hardness to it. It's got some alkalinity, but it's not anything that's difficult to deal with. But our calcium levels are relatively low. Our chloride and sulfate levels are also relatively low. But we mostly build up our IPA water with uh, with gypsum. We don't use any calcium chloride in our water additions for our IPAs. And so it's all uh, it's all burtonized with gypsum. We add some uh, acid to the mash to get our pH in the right range for all that starch conversion uh, with our grain. And then we do add some additional acid uh, in the whirlpool at the end of the at the end of the boil, along with some gypsum. So the actual finishing pH and mineral level in the beer is a little different than what's optimal in the mash. So we add we add gypsum and acid at two different points. Cool. <laughs> um, so I know uh, some of the like West Coast of some of the most famous uh, West Coast IPAs um, or, or double IPAs. I know um, Vinny at Russian River has been pretty open. I think he even mentioned. Well, no, he didn't mention it on, uh, here, but it was um, how like Pliny has changed over the years that they're really going for kind of like. <laughs> I don't know. This is my words, not his, but like a concept or like where does Pliny kind of fit into kind of um, craft drinkers like IPA drinking behavior. And I, um, Union Jack um, has like uh, it's changed drastically from what it was even like 10 years ago. I think it's it's much it's much lighter um, is is that pretty typical of, of what's going on? Are West Coast IPAs evolving and becoming lighter over time? Uh, or, or let's even take it down to like the, the real Southern California West Coast style. Have, have those stayed pretty consistent or are those kind of evolving over time as well? Those are evolving over time okay. as well. And, and I think there's actually some influence, believe it or not, that's coming from Hazy IPA. In that, uh, if you were to go back maybe 10, 15 years, there were plenty of West Coast IPAs out there that were bracingly bitter. Yeah, like tons. Some might have argued yeah. a little. Yeah, some might have argued almost too bitter. And uh, even if you don't gravitate towards hazy IPAs, they they do have uh, quite a bit of hop flavor and certainly a lot of hop aroma, and they've. You know, a lot of them have a, a degree of softness to them. So I think a lot of West Coast IPA brewers realized, okay, maybe I can I can pull back on some of the bitterness a little bit and focus more on hop flavor and even more attention to hop aroma. And so I think there was. Oh no! Uh oh, we froze. Hold on. What's happening here, Serge? What have you done? <laughs> Oh, oh, are we back? Are you back? Are you back? Sorry. I'm here. Okay. Froze for a second. You froze for a moment. We blamed Sir. I froze. Okay. It's all good. I br blame the producer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I was, fault, yeah. I was saying that I, I do think West Coast IPA has, has evolved a little bit, and I think there's yeah. been some influence from Hazy IPA uh, in that you have West Coast IPAs that overall are maybe not quite as bitter as they used to be and yeah. focused even more on hop aroma and hop flavor and Amalgamator certainly is that way. Mm -hmm. um, that is a beer that when we first started brewing it, uh, roughly 12, 11, no, 11 years ago is when we started brewing it. That beer had you know, five different kettle hop additions, um, 
it had it didn't have any crystal malt in it it did have a little a uh, little bit of specialty malt in there um, but that's a beer now that that has you know it, it's almost entirely focused on mosaic hops we use a, uh, a bittering extract in that beer we actually use a bittering extract in all of our hoppy beers at our, our production facility because it's very precise consistent and neutral um so, I mean, that's something that we, we never used hop extract when we first started brewing that beer, and now we're almost entirely on hop extract for at least our bittering additions. All right. Right. Um, it's, it's funny. Uh, I, I think that's just how general drinking preferences are going. It's like a little bit less on the aggressive bittering hops. Um, you can still get those in San Diego. I mean, I was at Pizza Port, and you can get some, like, old-school West Coast. I, unless they were even more bitter than I, I remember. But it's it's funny. Like, a, a beer that kind of comes to mind as this, like, um, like proto, like, or, or just kind of ahead of its time. It actually wasn't f- even from the West Coast. Um Main Beer Co., I think, was, like, on that kind of, like, softening up the bittering, pushing sure. the aroma big time with, like, beers like Lunch and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's funny that that's you know, obviously not a... Uh, do they even consider what they make, West Coast IPAs? They're probably just like, we make our beer. I don't yeah, know. I think they make main beers. Yeah, they make <laughs> main they, beers. They, they right. talk about it. Right. But I do think it's kind of a, a, a trend overall. Um, but But that kind of makes me wonder like are are there um any is there anyone out there like far away from the west coast i would even say like further away than like fremont who is they're still on the west Coast. who are true all right fine (laughs) but you know we're talking about san diego style but um true all right is there anyone off the west coast who's like you nailing that style that you guys are are aware of Fatheads, for fat sure. Heads. Oh, totally. Fatheads <laughs> fat heads is doing. Yeah, Westbound and Down Comrade Brewing is doing it. Um, Those guys, they're all doing yeah, it. It's amazing. I love the guys. Those guys are great. Uh, so yeah, there are definitely definitely people doing it. But um, did you fat heads might be the most right. central geographically in the United States? Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some people. <laughs> yeah, I can't, but... I can't believe you both just said fatheads. I know fatheads because crap. we talk about fatheads <laughs> every way, episode. way too much. We can't get it here, and we're like campaigning with them yeah. hard to to start getting some headhunter here. Yeah. So <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. That's so awesome. Good. Yeah, Sean, it's, so good. Yeah. Sean and yeah. Julian, as it relates to Chris's question about the evolution that you guys have seen in your beers or in West Coast IPA, how do you guys mm-hmm. feel that? Uh, the the variety of 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 malt you know of malt suppliers as it relates to the base malt that you guys use um, in your beers has has affected the way that your guys' beers have evolved. Sean, do you want to tackle this one first? I I I, I can't speak to that really. We've been stuck on uh, RARS uh, Alix two row for the better part of twenty years. Uh, you know, we used that with Alpine, uh, using that with McElhenney, um, and it's just a really good malt. doesn't fluctuate very much. It comes in abundance, uh, and I'm able to get contracts for my small, <laughs> very modest 12,000-pound silo. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's that's <laughs> our same base malt as well. Um, but we, we have experimented with different base malts in – our West Coast IPAs, uh, like almost it. every almost every British malt that's out there, lots of different Pilsner malts that are out there. And sometimes it's kind of fun um, to get an even lighter color in there. And there's, there's a little bit of a difference, um, but I, I don't know that I've ever had a, like a, a smashing example of a West Coast IPA where I was like, ah, it's the base malt. That's the secret ingredient. <laughs> Right. That's what they don't understand. Right. It's all about the That'd base probably be malt. quite a problem if you were like, ah, this West Coast IPA is very malty. Right. <laughs> right. Where, where were you but, when they said malt yeah. is the enemy? Uh, society. What, what's that? Soci- society. Society. This was years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Were shocked when they said malt is the enemy. Malt is the enemy. And I remember being like, whoa, what's, who are these people? Yeah. Right. And the only reason they that came, I asked they came that in the future. is it will use a lot of briefs. Um, like uh, two row or, or breeze pills 
um, and we'll use RAR pills. But we've we've started to lean heavily, um, started to lean heavily into like Canada Malting Company's Superior pills, just going for as pale as we can get, sure. and then and we'll come no, over and the that's top. A, with that's that. a fantastic <laughs> malt. We we use that. We first used that, I think, in a West Coast IPA like four or five years ago, and it's a it, it was a sleeper malt forever. And then, um, and then we, we, we've used it a few times. I've recommended it to some other brewers. It's come up in collaborations and people are like, Whoa, this is a really good malt. It's got great plump kernels, uh, good extract. Um, but, uh, <laughs> the price is, the price is good. Uh, you can get silo fills of it if you want uh-huh. to. Sure. Uh, it's not as economical as Rar Turo, but it's still a fantastic malt. It's really, really good. Right on. Here with that. Awesome. Yeah. I, if if it's okay with everyone, I would like to get a, a refresh on my beer. So can we take take five and then uh, and then come back and, and finish this up? You guys cool with that? Sure. Totally. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Sounds good. I'll okay. pause my video. Awesome. All right. We'll see you guys in a few. All right. All right. All right. What was the name of that brew pub up above? Was it called the Great Lady? Oh. Something like that. But. It was when Gabe was still in the basement of that brew pub, um, and he had a whole bunch of fooders down there. He had a small bottling line, but he poured me. Um, I think it was some. I think it was some Galaxy, um, that was a year old, and you would have thought that it just came off of the bright tank. It was so perfectly preserved. Yeah, it's amazing. We just started uh, recording again. I just want to let everyone know that we're, you know, okay. Officially, well, we're on we're on the record. You're supposed but to we ask can... them the sneak attack questions before you tell them. Right, I just, right. I just said a whole <laughs> bunch of cool shit. Now nobody's gonna remember it. Well, see, that's why I said record, record, but they didn't. But want that to. was a time to red IPA. Said, was... Hazy IPA is better right? than West Coast yeah. IPA. That's crazy. We recorded <laughs> yeah, that, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, they said exactly. bread IPA okay. is better. Yeah, oh, bread IPA is better than West Coast yeah. IPA. Yeah, that a moment. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah. So uh, no, I, 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 I agree. We were having some, some, good, some good Orval yeah, talk, but Round Vare, like one of, one of the all time greats. Yeah, that beer totally. was special. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. Nailed it. yeah, yeah. And developed like when it was fresh. I remember it was like. Or I remember having like this. I remember thinking it was like so like springtime. I was like, oh, it tastes. It's like flowers coming out of the dirt, and I was getting all like, you know, you know poetic and romantic. Poetic about it, and then it became totally different as as it, it aged, and I mean aged like for like a year or two, and it was so good. And um, uh, Hobbs from uh, Salamoth just last week was like, do you have any round there still? <laughs> we're trying to do a beer. We're trying to do a, like an homage ago, to that. Hobbs. I was like, yeah, he was like, we're trying to do an homage to that beer. And I was like, man, I, that... I might have a bottle, Ooh, but like, I think that beer just, is now dead, just man. Drink I'm sorry. Ball, yeah. Cause I had yep. some and it's like, you know, it, yeah. it, it's time has passed. Right. It's time has passed finally. But it, that, Beer did last hey, for a long served, time. It served well, you know. Yeah. He just yeah. successfully tapped out, what is it, a fast keg? Yeah. They just successfully tapped one today at Goldfinger. It's uh, a good video of that good, on good the internet right now. Yeah. Nice. Good for them. Um, okay. So we're here. Back with, to the only style yes. that actually matters. Right. Mm-hmm. San Diego specific West Coast <laughs> idea. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But for real. San Diego adjacent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. My bad. Whoops. Whoops. Yeah, San Diego County and adjacent <laughs> counties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sunshiny. Yeah. Um, so where do we want to where do we want to go from here, uh, Mike? Uh, we've talked about. Let's go to the Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. There you uh, are. How about how the evolution of American hops and going into like kind of new hop products, how that's affected or been integrated into kind of more traditional San Diego style, West Coast IPA. Right, because that's what I keep, you know, I hear a ton about that is where kind of hops are moving is, you know, yes, varietals, but also hop, you know, hop, new hop yeah, products hop, that yeah. are out cool. there. Hop products. Hop products. Yeah. All of that, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, better brewing through science. So if you can, uh, if you can create a product that, that, makes makes it easier for for brewers to make great beer um go go for it go ahead and use that stuff um new hop varietals is 
has been a huge, huge step forward for a lot of West Coast IPAs. There's so many more aromas and flavors that are available to us in any combination in between. Um, one of my favorites is still Mosaic. Uh, I've had very few hops since Mosaic that came out where I thought, you know, like, man, this has got so many different flavors and aromas. Uh, Mosaic still dazzles me, especially when it's really good selected mosaic. It still dazzles me. A mm-hmm. um, couple newer varietals that have dazzled me, uh, 586 is mm-hmm. pretty pretty awesome. Um, I've had some Idaho yeah. 7 that has been mind-blowing too. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've had some really, really remarkable strata as well. Um, but, but 586 is probably the one hop that has really dazzled me um, in, in recent times, but that's mosaic what, that's, is that's still you put in the beer that, uh, you made for, for, for beer temple unofficially yes. made for beer temple. Yeah. And I think five, eight, six was, was your suggestion, right? Jude, wasn't it? Like, I don't know if I can take credit of it. I was just uh, a part I think, I was just a part of the, yeah, I thought you said a little bit of five, eight, six might be really nice for it. You guys were leading the conversation. Mm hmm. I mean, I, it was uh, it was in there. Yeah, that was about I think it was roughly it wasn't a quarter of the dry hop. It was mostly that beer was Nelson, mostly yeah. driven by Beechwood Select Mosaic. And then we did have some uh, no, five, eight, Nelson, six. Nelson, Nelson, it was yeah. about no, it was all Nelson. it was all Nelson and five, eight. Six oh, that's right. Was. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. It was Beechwood Select Nelson. Excuse. Jesus, there goes my fucking memory. Um, <laughs> it was Beechwood Select Nelson. And then uh, it was the five, eight, six. Right. Yeah, I think. I think that was about 20% of the dry hop. Right. Yeah, I wanted to do a, a, a West, uh, a, a Southern California West Coast IPA, very Nelson heavy. Uh, I wonder where I got that idea from. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a good, completely new, unique yeah. idea. No, I mean, Sean, I mean, just like as a, as a, a side, um, like, uh, I don't know how to even. Act. I don't know if this is a statement or a question or what. <laughs> Remember when you made Nelson? Yeah, that was cool. Remember, yeah, exactly. It's like the Chris Farley show. Remember that time you made Nelson? That was awesome. <laughs> but it's like, is is it? It's kind of like one of the most legendary IPAs ever. I'm more of a of all time man myself. Now. Uh, yeah, my, yeah, exactly. Um, but it's it is. I mean, I do totally agree with with uh, Julian. Not that for for. I mean, I don't know that. I mean, I I sure I believe it. It's true that yeah that that's why Nelson's here, um, like physically why it's here, but why it's here and being brewed with and so popular, I think is is very much because of uh, the beers that you guys made. Um, I mean, is that how you guys see it? Or are you guys, uh, I mean, you can say yes. Yeah, you can say yes. I'm trying to, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, It was purely based on we wanted to make beer that we wanted to drink. And it just so happened that it aligned with what the consumers were wanting at the time. I can't really speak to its popularity just because it's such an anomaly in this industry to have a beer that was so well known, so widely just took off out of nowhere. And um, that was always a beer that we couldn't make enough, couldn't make it fast enough. And also like it's, it's, it's got this status with industry people. It's like a legendary beer. Like, like, I don't know. I'm sure casual drinkers in, in non, you know, in, in, in the, in the Midwest and on, on the East coast, like some may know about Al, uh, about Nelson from Alpine, but like industry people, like you, even if they haven't had it, they've heard about it. Like yeah. I, I've talked to people who've been like, Oh yeah, I've, I've, I've heard about it. it. It's like, it comes at a real magical time. You know, they're, they're, it, I, th- I think that Amarillo might be, you know, the most exciting thing that's coming up at the time. And then I'm going to think about like, you know, the first time I had, I think Great Lakes Chill Wave had was right, the first mosaic. time I had Mosaic. Yeah, yeah, and, me too. And, and yeah. I had never experienced anything like that hop. Um, the first time 
I had zombie dust or cenotaph <laughs> right next to Aotera at the brew pub in Munster. You know, that first time I had citra like that, that was an experience. And the fr- and that was the first time we were experiencing flavors like that. And Nelson um, was another hop where at just at this point we had never experienced those three different layers and levels of flavor. It blew the yeah. roof off of everything. Um, what a great time. But I think that that's and, everything we're talking about. Go ahead, Julian. And when it comes to Nelson, too, that was that was a hop that uh, it was really, unless you had it on contract already, like several years in advance, for a while it was really, really difficult to get. And I just said, you know what, forget it. We've got so many other amazing hops uh, available to us that we have on contract. And so for several years, we didn't brew with it. And then we were able to get it on contract again. It started becoming a little bit more available a few years ago. And I said, okay, you know what? I'll put a couple hundred pounds in my contract. And, um, and the Nelson that we were, we were allocated um, at that particular time was random. We didn't select it. And it happened to be that magical Nelson that, that brought me back to the first time I had Alpine Nelson. And that's yeah. the Nelson aroma and flavor that I want. What I first experienced with Alpine Nelson, that's what I want out of my Nelson. And I was like, oh, my God. It, I, I, that's what everyone wants. Like, where did this, where did this Nelson wants. come from? Because yeah. uh, as its popularity grew, uh, there was more acreage being planted. but And it changed. Getting Nelson more. changed, man. But it still feels Nelson, like a Not, not Nelson yeah. the beer. No. Well, Nelson the beer changed no, Nelson also. the hop changed Sorry, for Sean. a time. No, Nelson, it Nelson did. The, Nelson, yeah. the hop, Nelson the hop changed, and there were a couple yeah. new uh, players in uh, in the market that were, were growing it. And okay. it was just a lot of that Nelson didn't, didn't hit the way that I wanted, and it didn't, like, to me, I wouldn't have known that it was necessarily Nelson. It did. Yeah really uh diverged quite a bit from from its origins i thought and recently and it feels it like of, it's being cared for yeah sorry yeah it, it did come back around and when we found when we randomly got allocated that nelson that that really hit for me i said where is this from and we were able to find out where it was from right. and that's where we that's the nelson that we select now yeah so yeah. sean anything you'd like to say or no, uh, we we are no. fortunate enough to deal with uh, freestyle hops out of New Zealand for for our Nelson needs, and all New Zealand varietals. Um, uh, <clears throat> we get our nectar on from uh, New Zealand Hops Limited, and it is that's that's one of my favorite new hops out currently. Um, and I just got some super delicate that I'm really interested to try. Uh, another new New Zealand variety that uh, has some promising attributes to it. So, mm -hmm. all right, we're lucky enough to select our Nelson from Freestyle too. So we we definitely get. You guys get the good stuff. I can't imagine. I would hope so. I would hope so. I mean, so on that, you know, the kind of that freestyle, you know, Southern Hemisphere hop thing, thiols have become a massive thing. And most people think of it probably in hazy IPA. Do you guys use right. any like phantasm or do you guys think about thiols or is that something that is not really necessary in the way that you make West Coast IPA or San Diego area? I, I, <laughs> I do to a small degree, but it depends on the hop varietals that I'm, I'm seeking out. So sure. we might be the only brewery on the West Coast that dry hops their beer with uh, six, uh, that dry hops beers with six, eight, uh, two. Um, which was formerly known as Pato. And that's a beer that has incredibly oh, high thiol awesome. levels. Um, and it's it was originally designed as a high alpha hop for bittering only. Uh, most of it gets made in a, a kind of a neutral bittering extract, which is what we use across the board with all of our hoppy beers. But uh, it has amazingly high thiol content. It's like a super CTZ. So it does okay. have garlic onion characteristics to it, but... If you put it in, in at like a third to 25% of the dry hop, it hits so dank. It's like bong resin that's been scraped out of the bowl. It's really intense. Wait, they, and that's thiols. That's mostly thiols that's doing that. But huh. um, I had, I've had a couple West Coast IPAs or what were branded as West Coast IPAs that were using some of those uh, newer thiolizing enzymes or thiolizing yeasts. 
And they had this really intense, like fruit salad, tropical fruit cup character that was to me very out of place. It didn't work for me in a West Coast IPA. Yeah, with that hazy IPA, you definitely, that, I think that's what the consumer is looking for, right? Mm-hmm. But with the West Coast, it's you, you want that clean, crisp, assertive bitter. But, you know, but we've got some room in there for uh, some of those tropical fruit characters. and Sure. But on the other end of the spectrum, where does uh, the, the, the Allium family of flavors have a, does it have a role in West Coast IPA? Because And explain <laughs> that for some of the people out there who might not know, you know what that the, is. The Styles o- they the, might get, but al- you might, might be going the, a little the far. OGs, the the, 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 yeah. the onion, the garlic, the, the thing that you and I love very dearly. But nobody else but, does. But seems to not be you know, the consumer's right. favorite. Is that still... Single s- Hop Summit. I mean, I'm, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wild ramp beer, essentially. <laughs> right, yeah. Get some Galena in there. <laughs> Ooh, old school. How about an Eroica? Um, so I, I, we keep... This is totally a trip down memory lane, this whole episode. So, And, and I'm glad that, that uh, Sean and I get to co-pilot this whole this whole uh, like reminiscence together. But Sean, you remember uh, green flash, uh, uh, green flash Imperial IPA. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I remember that. So that, that was <laughs> probably, I was probably the first, that was summit and nugget. And that was, um, I love that, so, uh, that beer. I love uh, that beer. It was fucking awesome. And I was, I remember the first time I bought a bottle of that. Uh, I was still a home brewer. I think that beer came out something like 15 or 16 years ago, but I bought a bottle of it and I call one of my buddies. I'm like, dude, you got to try this, this, uh, green flash Imperial IPA. And he said, I just cracked a bottle. What the fuck is going on with this beer? It's crazy. And that was summit. And, uh, summit. I, I, I like the garlic and onion. I did too. Um, And Oscar blues always knew how to work with that hop really well. It was, it was, it was a fun beer. It was a fun hop. It's gone now, right? Does it, I mean, is it even around? No, it's still, it's, it's still around. And I'm probably the only person who, um, ever complained to a supplier that my son didn't have enough garlic onion in it. (laughs) (laughs) Does does Nugget have a place? Does Nugget have a place in modern West Coast IPA? Uh, Maybe as as a bittering hop, if you wanted to get that kind of (laughs) That's a no. As an aroma flavor hop, probably not. Yeah. We were using that in pure hoppiness. No way. For a long time, our double IPA, uh, you know, Predominantly Columbus, but uh, a spattering of Centennial, Cascade, and a little bit of Nugget, too. Um, mostly on the hot side. Yeah, uh, it's more of a, like a kettle flavor back, is what um, I associate it with, that, that Nugget that nugget nectar. Yeah. Right. Um, oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a, it's a solid hop. I mean, if we're, if we're going back, yeah, there's there's some fun old hops that are just, yeah, you don't, you don't see anymore. But there's so many other new hops, too, that... It's, it's all good. It's all good. And um, hot products. But they've right. all and mostly products, diverged right. from that, right? Um, almost all of the new like hop varietals, they're, there's not even many whiffs of that oniony garlic. OG, I think, has come back in the past year. Where, where, I think it like, might have come did... back in the beer flavor profiles, yeah, not in the yeah, hops yeah. they're breeding now. They're almost like trying to breed those out. Oh, oh, that I wouldn't know. But I'm just saying They've in the end, in the end products, I, it, it, those flavors have started to, to creep back because I lamented, you know, maybe three or four years ago, there was like this, um, like it, it was like homogenous, like all the flavor profiles were so similar. I know it's awesome lacing. Um, they were so similar, like everything was going for juicy fruity whether it was hazy or not it was just like juicy fruity juicy fruity and it's like you know like i love i love citra you know it's great but like you know if everything is citra then nothing is citra you know like you can't that's, stand that's out deep right and <laughs> now at least we're getting like piney again og we're getting you know and now i think it allows some of these other flavors to kind of like you know, stretch out a little bit more and, yeah. and show yeah, them. A complete profile has edge. Right, right. So I don't know. I'm happy that there seems to be some divergence of 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 hot profiles, even within IPA. Um, 
it, it's it's one of the things that was like the most I'd ever gotten like tired of craft beer being this is my living was was during those like days where like everything was to me tasted the same. I don't know if it was like that in the west on the west coast, but I was like, geez, this is man, this this all this hazy stuff. Like I like hazy, but boy, oh boy, it's got to be something else. So yeah. speaking speaking of kind of new school meets old school, this beer that we did with um, with Fremont, it was all of our silo two row, and then we we bittered it with. 682 extract and the whirlpool hop was chinook oh nice super classic hop uh, that everybody on the west coast loves and then the dry hop on it was simcoe Mm -hmm. uh which was newer school but still you know kind of becoming old school it's like now motley crew is classic rock um (laughs) and then uh (laughs) citrus in there and then to go kind of modern and retro at the same time we use centennial cryo yeah. Okay. So the dry right, was right. Citra, cryo. Citra, Simcoe, and then Centennial Cryo. Yeah. So, yeah. Fun. So this beer that we got, Parallel Paradise. Oh, God. Yeah. Really yeah, I've had it. It's exceptionally yeah, so we good. we just got a gold medal at the San Diego International Beer Competition here in San Diego for right West Coast IPA with this guy. Congrats. Yeah, thank you. You know, it's got all the heavy hitters in there. You got your Strata, Citra, Mosaic. We got Cryo Simcoe, Cryo Mosaic, Cryo Citra, CGX Strata, the new indie hop version or Crosby hop version of right uh, Strata. Yeah, pretty good. We do something a little different with this. We actually add hops to the fermenter prior to fermentation. And so we'll knock out hot work into it just to kill off anything that might be a uh, cause for concern. And then just knock out normal temp or maybe a few degrees below to start that biotransformation bio effect right off the get. So instead of dry hopping during active fermentation and risking an, an exploding tank, you just get it all done right off the get. Interesting. Uh, and then after fermentation is complete, we dump yeast. We aren't harvesting this uh, the yeast from those beers, but uh, then we hit it with a traditional dry hop, and then we'll do a recirculation on it, So would which you- I think really makes the flavors and aromas just explode. So like how would that differ from like a whirlpool edition? Just contact time or does it just interact differently or are they, they kind of the way that the yeast is interacting with the hops that are in suspension. Oh, right? because it's 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 when the e- e- it's right as the yeast is introduced so it's not it's not begun fermentation yet. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Cool. It's crazy, but it works. <laughs> is there like it. Is there anyone uh, out in uh, California that you guys feel is like really innovating or maybe like one to watch who's who's doing new things in the realm of uh, West Coast IPAs? Besides yourselves, obviously. besides yourselves, obviously, because you're obviously uh, you, you, you you are the well, you know one A and one B. I won't say who's who, right. but you know, you know, well, they know. Yeah, right. <laughs> North Park Beer Company, I think, is one that comes to mind right off the bat. Kelsey and his team yep. are doing some crazy stuff over there, uh, and then Evan at Green Cheek, and the guys over at Highland Park. You know, these guys are all just Timbo, baby. yeah, got some killing the game. Right the beach, you know, Julian and Beachwood and everybody. Yeah, obviously, all those all those places that Sean just mentioned are making amazing IPAs, and it is really cool to see new techniques incorporated. Uh, I know Kelsey does this technique that he calls hop dipping, where he'll take a concentrated hop extract uh, and he will put that in the fermenter before he even introduces wort. He will introduce hot wort to kind of uh, melt that hop extract and incorporate it into the beer, and then start filling the fermenter with cool wort so it's all at a normal uh, temperature that's it's happy for the fermentation when he's all done with that process. But And this is that uh, North the Park, park or, or is that? Okay. Citra that? Incognito hop house character, yeah. right? North Park In- house character. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So Kelsey's doing that. He's making amazing beers. So is, as, as Sean mentioned, Highland Park and Green Cheek. And anytime I have those beers, you know, I, I take notes like, okay, this is – what am I smelling here? Okay, how do we, we guys? We gotta, we gotta up our game. We gotta, right. we gotta turn it up a notch. But um, one of the breweries that, or one of the brewers that I, I really look to consistently now for some of 
the West Coast IPAs I enjoy the most is uh, Zach Frazier. Shred. Is, Shred. You know, yeah, Shred, which I fucking love the name. That's a great <laughs> name. Uh, Zach but Zach, cool killing shit. it. They're, they're doing Shred amazing brewing. stuff, and they're, they're getting just such intensity out of their beers. And the, they're dry hopping at a very, very high rate. That always helps. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But the beers are super clean. They're they're very technically driven. Uh, they have a right, just the right balance of of art and science going on. But they're very intense and they're very very clean. And I really enjoy what they're doing. Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Where is Shred? Uh, the Greater uh, Sacramento right. area, so Central okay. California, the capital city. Got it. Yeah. All right. You, you you're familiar, huh? Yeah, we brew beer with them. Yeah. Of course you have. Former Slice and then Moonraker, but Zach oh, Shred. Okay. All right. Of course. Thanks for bringing some All he does is win medals. Yeah, right? <laughs> yes. All he does is catch touchdowns. In fact, they just got at, uh, at, at GABF, they just got, uh, what was it, small, yeah. small Brewery of the Year. I, they entered like five beers, and I think, what was it? Was it four of them that medaled? Yep. They won Alpha King, too. Like that, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah they, won, they medaled at Alpha King, too. It was like boom, 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 boom. They just... just that whole they, week they, they did it crushed it it was awesome i was so happy for them julian and he's well also famous too. for the for this sorry for this is radio horns, but or zach the, zach the, is metal. that's always oh, zach yeah, is yeah, big yeah, for yeah. that gene simmons yeah, yeah. no they're True. great they're great we brewed uh we brewed when he was at slice we brewed a beer called farm fresh with 586 equinot citra yeah. there was one other hop we left off but uh, i think we leaned into some like pilsner malt with him but zach's been zach's dope zach's great yeah, yeah. Yep, for sure. So let me ask yeah. then. We've been talking about a lot about what makes an IPA and, or West Coast IPA. And really, and I'm, I'm, I'm so happy, I just have to say, that Julian immediately was like, well, really, we have to get hyper local. Because this is like a lot of what you guys said is what we say on the show all the time. It's like there's it's really the San Diego and adjacent area ipa it's like it's its own little little bubble so when i think west coast ipa that's that's what i'm kind of thinking of same right. i think that's what most people i'm not in thinking, the of the thinking of the lagunitas ipa too, right? even the old school mm -hmm. lagunitas ipa that's like that's not what i'm i'm thinking about no. um but what do you think are the biggest um like pitfalls when other breweries are making what they are calling West Coast IPA because we had uh, Garrison uh, for Tony from Russian River here, uh, and he was. I, I gave him a beer. I was like, what do you think of this beer? And he was like, it's good, it's clean. You know, he was like being very technical about it, and I don't. He didn't know what my angle was, so he was trying to be very nice. And he was like, it's a good beer, and it was a good. A lot beer. of gotcha journalism. It was a good. There. No, this wasn't on air. This was like at the bar. This was at the bar. <laughs> It wasn't on air. He was, he, yeah, he was just here. Um, yeah. yeah. And I was joke. like, I was like, yeah, it's good. He's like, yeah, that's a good beer. I was like, is it a West Coast IPA? He's like, oh, no, no. Yeah. And I was like, it's that right there. <laughs> and it was like labeled as a West Coast IPA. And I couldn't have agreed more, but I just wanted to like get validation. Mm. Uh, he it's, was like, oh, it's a good beer. He's like, it's not a it's, West Coast IPA. And I'm just curious, like, to you two, Sean and, and Julian, like what what do you see uh, coming from other parts of the country when or, or maybe even your own part? I don't know. Uh, that's like that's not a West Coast IPA. Are there certain kind of elements that you're noticing are, are off? Uh, I think a lot of people, a lot of people miss the mark in the beer is not dry enough. They incorporate crystal malt. They don't have uh, enough. <laughs> firm bitterness and that doesn't necessarily have to be driven entirely by hops but they could also be missing a uh, a sulfate edge that's driving that bitterness too but it's it's yeah it's it's typically they're just they're they're not bright enough they're not dry enough and um i kind of think about any regional style of beer or regional styles of wine um if you go to it, you, you could probably find call shit at any number of breweries in the United States, go to Cologne. You'll have a very, <laughs> very different experience. Right. And, uh, you know, I, I'm going to confess uh, guilty pleasure. My wife and I are members of the Corbell wine club. <laughs> 
Hey, that's where Russian River started. Yeah, so that's <laughs> yes. don't knock yes. it. Don't right. knock it. Anyway, but you have that beer. It's great. It's it's very clean, very technically driven, sparkling wine. It it's not champagne. You sure. go to the champagne sure. region, it is very different than sparkling wines that are made in the United States. And so um I think there are always regional characteristics of of any wine style of beer, whatever it is, that just don't seem to to translate to other regions, especially if people haven't been there and lived there and experienced stuff at the source. Yeah. It tends to be a very contained experience. Yeah, I'm surprised with like West Coast. I'm sorry, Sean, did I cut you off? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised that more people aren't making their West Coast IPAs more uh, well, then again, maybe I was going to say more accurate, but maybe not. Maybe they're just like, it's all branding. It's all marketing. This, right. well, this also- is the beer I want to make. And if I call it West Coast, more people will try it because, yeah, they're 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 you said crisp. It's almost like they, they tend to be like fat or flabby or something. They're Dude, just they don't. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. They're just they don't, they don't have snap. that brightness and snap that. That's the good one. But, but, even, but even, very even, interesting. Yeah. Even yeah. let's say we did, let's say we brewed that beer and we hit on all those things. You yeah. know, we always like in in my mind, we're always like beer's got to have soul, and we're always approaching it not only from the science standpoint, but from like why did we do the thing we did, and and, and who are we as beer makers? Mm-hmm. And the leg up that you guys will always have is that they live the life. We don't, <laughs> you know. Right. So it's like. So we could nail on all those things, but for me, the the reason, even if the beer tasted the same, they're making it there, and we're not, right? You know, and that's that's the magic. And 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 and, and I would hope the same thing if we tried to position, if we could land on a not a style or a, a way of making beer or whatever it is, but we had a, a point of view or a perspective or just an authenticity to it, we can't we can't compete with that. You guys are there, you guys live it, and. And that makes that beer even better. Right. No. You know? I, and that's I, what makes the beer that, and, and no one can make West Coast beer. There are people that could be making it just as good as West Coast beer, but I, I, from from a brewery perspective or a fan perspective, they live the life. They're out there doing it. Right. Yeah. I mean, even the fathead stuff is. I mean, I, I'll say right now, Headhunter is my favorite IPA there is, but I don't know if it's a truly Southern California. I, West Coast style IPA. It's got a little Midwest in there's it. There's some color know? to it. Yeah, there's, there's got a little some, Midwest. A but I live in the Midwest. I like it. I like that. But it it's is a dry. Dank you know, like, Ohio yeah, it is beer. Dry. That's what yeah. to me. That's what fed. It's a dank Ohio beer, and of that's course. great for me. I can't think of two climates that are more similar than Cleveland and uh, <laughs> Southern California. Yeah, so. right. When I'm in, whenever <laughs> I'm in Cleveland, they definitely live the life there in Cleveland. That's so Cal life. Yeah, that salty in Middleburg Heights, ocean air. Yeah, the surfing isn't as good in Cleveland, but yeah. Yeah, yeah it's small, right. It's that's the only detail. difference. I think a lot of things aren't as good. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, how dry is, is is dry enough, right? How dry do these things need to be? So I'll just uh, you don't need to go all the way to zero. Fairly right? regular, we get fairly regular lap work done on our um, all of our beers, but most of our West Coast IPAs they're all malt, and the way that we uh, we treat them, we get high attenuation. So most of our West Coast IPAs are around 88 to 89% attenuated. Whew. They're really dry for an all malt beer. And so it's it's not uncommon for amalgamator, just to kind of throw out some numbers for the beer nerds out there, usually starts around uh, 14.7 to 14.8 Play-Doh. And then it typically fi- finishes around 1.2 to 1.3 Play-Doh. Yeah, that's it's dry. 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 It's that's really dry. dry. It's really dry. That's, We're hitting right around 1.5, 1.7. Uh, not as dry, but that's what seems to work for us. So yeah, yeah, that's still awesome. pretty darn dry. That's pretty dry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, much drier than I think most of the West Coast IPAs that I think get made in Chicago. Anyway, for sure. Um, yeah. And, and is yeast character treated like malt character? It's the enemy. Are we just trying to get really clean uh, fermentation? Are we trying to find subtle esters and things i'm not looking for subtle esters i'm looking for clean uh very very clean dry you know uh character that that is kind of sitting in the background yeah very neutral but when we're when we're really lucky our 
our house ale yeast, which is a Chico derivative from Sierra Nevada. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure our supplier would claim it came from Sierra Nevada originally, <laughs> but who knows? Anyway, it's a Sierra Nevada derivative. But when our yeast is really in that sweet spot, there's this tiny element of Elmer's glue. <laughs> you know, everybody like everybody remembers when they yeah. graduated from you guys are the pace kids. And the reason I say that is I get that out of Sierra Nevada. Um, maybe about a third of the time when their really? beers are just cool. like really perfectly lined up. Huh. I, I mentioned this to Ken Grossman one time. I was like, Hey Ken, you know, like, <laughs> like this beer is like this batch of celebration is so good. Like I, I totally get that perfect Sierra Nevada, like yeast expression, you know, where you just get that hint of Elmer's glue. And he was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, well that's my thing then. I'll hold on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought exactly. it was like, no, I use glue when I was welding dairy tanks back in the day, so I had right. to carry that flavor on somehow. So yeah. I, you think this it was is firm well, remember in kindergarten you eat paste and like, well, no, the glue is much better. Yeah, that's right. I've I, I've I've put the, the, it out. That's there. the West Coast versus I put New out England some, style. The difference, yeah. There. yeah. Elmer's glue versus lunch paste. time is for Miss Lippy. <laughs> well, well, I've de- <laughs> I've, uh, I've definitely put out some weird flavor notes to different creators of beer and sometimes they're like oh my god and you like you connect and other times they're like what the fuck are you talking <laughs> can you about? leave yeah <laughs> yeah so, so speaking of i have a i have a question uh for sean what it, what's like the strangest beer that you've had in recent memory <sighs> what a question yeah i love it something that was extremely sabro heavy and to me, I couldn't get past that it was, it smelled like I was drinking a bottle of Coppertown sunblock, mm. and I didn't like that at all. <laughs> yeah. The the coconut and the IPA thing just it doesn't. I'm not I'm not on board. It's not for me. Yeah, I know that hops not you, for Julian? everybody. It's very. Um, I was at the, uh, my wife and I were, were doing a tour at the, uh, the Heineken brewery and they tasted us on a whole bunch of their other, other brands like Heineken owns Aflagem, yeah. um, I believe and brews a lot of their beers, but, uh, we had a beer, uh, over there that was, uh, it's one of their, their larger, larger brands. And they're like, it's brewed, it's a lager that's brewed with sea salt and I remember having it, and I think there, look, there probably was a little bit of sea salt in there, but there was a whole lot of something else going on, um, and the beer smelled like sweetened seaweed to me. Hmm. It was really, it was, you guys know that that sushi called, um, what is that one sushi that's got the uh, sweetened omelet on top? Yeah, and it's tamago. Seaweed. Yeah. Is it the tamago? Okay, it's the... Yeah, I was okay. I was, it's Tamago. I was originally thinking Tobiko, but that's the flying fish row. Yeah. It's the Tamago roll, and that's what that beer smelled and tasted like. Uh. <laughs> that is wild, frightening. Yeah, it was. It was. It, was it, it wasn't working. It right? wasn't working. It was bizarre. I was really was hoping. Really bizarre. I was really hoping they were going to give you a Heineken. San Diego style West Coast IPA. <laughs> that blew like, your mind. Like, this is two and a half Play-Doh, you idiots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the fuck is this? You know what? I will. I will say though that kind of speaking the ultra regional experience. Um, uh, I was in. Uh, I, I was. This is the like another trip that I, I took. But my wife and I were in Strasbourg, France. And we went to a brew pub cafe that had two beers on tap. They had an, uh, an amber and a blonde. They were both so bizarre. I couldn't even identify where the flavors came from. But we went to a small brew pub in Strasbourg called Au Brasseur, which I think translates to the brewer. And they had three primary beers on tap. They had a blonde, an amber, and a dark. And they were all Belgian uh, yep. styles. Okay. And they were so good. And it was that, like, that yeast character that you just don't get at American breweries for whatever reason. And then they had a fourth beer on tap and the, uh, the, uh, bartender said, Oh, you're, you're American. Oh, you, you gotta try. We, we brewed an IPA. You gotta try the IPA. Oh no. I said, no, 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 it's okay. I appreciate that. But these three, I'm, I'm really happy with what's in front of me right now. He goes, no, you're going to, you're not going to want to miss this one. And, it was this really like hazy amber kind of muddy thing. 
And I just didn't even know what it was. It was unrecognizable as an IPA. <laughs> and, uh, you know, not, not to knock those guys because the other beers that I had were fantastic, but it just made me think that, you know, that's probably what a lot of brewers from other countries think when they have, uh, American beers like, Oh yeah, yeah. you're a, you're a brewer in Belgium. Try my, try my Belgian golden ale. And they're like, yeah, I can, oh. I can drink this. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, that's true. This yeah. is not a let this is just, not a Belgian gold nail. Let me just have the IPA. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was pleasantly yeah. surprised in Italy by the quality of of the beer. Now it didn't have the vibrancy on the hoppy styles uh, that you get here in in the states, but I mean, it's just they were they were good. They were their own thing. Yeah, they were a little bit muted from a hop perspective. They were maybe they would say they were more balanced. Sure, but I I was expecting I mean, them to be like Ugh. just the infrastructure isn't there for to they're behind uh, like what America has for like. Well, they don't even have cold cold boxes. storage. Yeah, right? like, they like, don't even have of cold both storage. the hops themselves and the finished beer. Also, yeah. they have to get them and imported. at the bars. Get they're all cold from, plates. Right. They pour off cold plates in most bars. Right, so. The, they just, they just, oh. really yeah, it's be, crazy, man. It's gonna be yeah. really hard for anywhere in Europe to make as good of hop driven beers yeah. this year. The kegs are just sitting Which, there and then... like has a lot to do with why these styles developed in America, right? Because the hops were here and we had more space to keep things cold. Like, it's like right. Like it wasn't possible in England when they started doing this. Yeah. So. Right. Right. Or, yeah. or Italy, they were Italy where it. it's like, we're in a 700 year old building. We're not going to put in refrigeration. <laughs> blow out that wall and yeah, then exactly. put a cold box down here. So the hops stay fresh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, <laughs> well, where does that, where does that leave us? Is there anything that we haven't, we haven't touched on? Can we touch on Dude, everything. I think we did. Yeah. I fanboyed out. out. I needed to do that, so I got that out of my system. <laughs> good. Did you though? Good. No, How I much haven't. you got left? Oh, I got a lot left. <laughs> uh, let's but go. We'll do that let's later. Close the show on. No, no. <laughs> this is the Patreon okay. episode. All right, fine. Yeah, I'll fanboy. Like gassed up a little I'll, bit. I'll fanboy. On. I will fanboy yeah. a little. All right. So I will say and also <laughs> <laughs> to the p- other people here, I need another beer for this. This is not. I do not typically do this. I do not typically do this. Nine fifty-three Chicago time. Shows. They got it's seven fifty-three like by go them. You into it. But no, this is like some of my absolute like favorite beer yeah. in the world. I think a lot of this is what kind of got me into craft beer. Uh, there are other styles as well, but. Um, yeah, I just think that you, your two breweries are just executing on such a high level um, that it's like really a treat to get to try beers that are being um, that are being made by by you guys. Uh, it's it's still special and regional, and um, it's it's enjoyable. I like that that like you were saying, Julian, that that these things can kind of like you can only get this this flavor profile and i don't know why when i'm in belgium and when i go to southern california it's like wow okay like yeah this is the home of this stuff and these these breweries are just killing it and um and even amongst them uh i i did i wouldn't put anyone above either of your two uh, breweries um and i went to all the hyped breweries that i heard all the you know the hype about and um uh, you guys are are just executing at you know you're at the the tippy top the, the, you know you're at the the highest level that is making it so thank you um, it's just I love that thank sort you. of stuff yeah yeah so that's my thank fanboy you, now you. are you happy Mike thank you. yeah yeah, yeah. Right. I am happy fanboy that was, that was nice to watch I'm happy yeah right that. I'm happy yeah yeah now yeah. you guys are just executing it at such a it's a, it's a treat to be able. To have the opportunity to to drink your beers now and then, and it's it's also in a way I like that I can't get it all the time because it's a little special then, mm-hmm. and then you know something about that. Three Floyds was on to something when they when they withheld uh, zombie dust artificially. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think so. Now now you can I get mean, it everywhere. My portfolio is screwed. Now you can get it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. All right, now you're up, Mike. Anything? <laughs> what are we? What are we gonna? No, I just how thank we you guys finish? both for coming on. Yeah. I mean, this has been uh, incredible. Uh, you know, talking. To, you know, talking about like. It was my pleasure. I believe the idea of 
terroir and beer is more based on the people who make it and the places you're making it rather than like what the actual earth is doing. So it's, you, know, you can get the same hops all the way across the country. So this is a perfect example of how like you guys being steeped in it in the place that West Coast uh, San Diego regional style IPA come from, it makes that a specific terroir for lack of a better word that we mm-hmm. just don't. And how don't awesome is that? It's, how, it's, how, it's so yeah, cool. Awesome. It's honestly, when you really think about it's it, it's vital. It's, it's cooler than thinking this particular plot of land makes these grapes taste this way. It's cooler than like these particular people living this particular life make this thing taste this way. Right. It's a much more alive version or human right. version of how alcohol imbues meaning. And so. it doesn't seem like it should be like that, but so far it is like that. I mean, yeah. The best ones be have like, come out of there do be like that. for a long time now. Yeah. You know, like 20 I think, years. I think everything, I think everything is like that too. Whether it's, whether it's food, architecture, um, beer, wine, uh, it just, uh, so many things are, are regional and, and kind of parochial, if you will. Yeah. Um, we have barrel aged beer uh, here. Right. I mean, barrel aged beer, when yeah. I go to, I mean, it's just, it, there's so much of it and there's so much good barrel aged beer here in Chicago. I mean, it's just it had. I don't know if it has the history of, of West Coast IPA, but it's getting up there now. I mean, yeah, it is cool. Yeah, I, I think it's. I think it's fun. It's exciting. And you were earlier. You were talking about canning a, a barrel aged beer in a couple of days, or maybe one that was just canned. But that's a very Chicago thing to do, and I applaud it. I, I love <laughs> the idea of of just running everything through my canning line. <laughs> we're well, doing we're, that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're always month. We've got a thirteen percent imperial stout, barrel aged imperial stout coming out in twelve ounce cans. Oh yeah. So you guys should we, trade. You doing two packs, four packs? Uh four packs. Oh yeah. Uh we'll so. probably sell some singles too, just because big ass beer. Even at twelve, I mean, 12 I ounces. You guys should probably trade okay. four packs of that, right? Maybe I don't know. <laughs> maybe share them with your friends yeah, right. if you do do that. Right. That'd be a right. cool thing to yeah. do. Then maybe connect about one hundred percent. We're always looking for reasons why things exist or why we wait, why we do the things that we do or, or you know the story behind them. But we're 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 our inspiration so much has is, is been geared towards the West Coast. I don't want in the beers that you guys make. I don't want to put uh, uh, words in their mouth. But the my favorite brewery and the brewery that I look up to the most is Half Acre, uh, and I know they draw sure. especially. Like, I mean, Daisy Cutter, of course, but beers like Vallejo, and I think that that ties back to the West Coast and and Pizza Port, but I know they draw direct inspiration from the West Coast, so um, all those things considered, it's it's great to to hear you guys talk about, you know, what what swirls through your brains um, when it comes to that kind of beer, but uh, when it looks from importance and inspiration, it's great great to to have someone to draw from, So, uh, so kudos to you guys for kicking ass. Yeah, thank well, you. Well, thank you very much for the kind words, and I have a really good team working for me. Uh, I can't take any of the credit. They, those guys do all the heavy lifting, and thank you to, to you and, and your fans. I mean, they're the ones who, who keep us in business, so I'm forever grateful. Awesome. Well, I think we've, 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 we've about done it. We've solved the... West Coast IPA, so now everyone yeah, can start making it. The definitive episode. <laughs> exactly. I think this is encyclopedic. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is Britannica. Right. Well, thank you, guys. Um, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, what do we got We got uh, coming up next week? Do we have another roundtable, I think, is what we're due for? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds right. Yeah, we got another We got a round. game show? We got another game show no, coming up? No? Although we've got a lot of people asking for, for the game another show. Game we show. did a... So sometimes we have to just mix up uh, <laughs> silly episodes, and we did, a, we did a Jeopardy game show style, which is where I didn't get uh, Orval uh, mm-hmm. You did win the whole thing. I did win the whole thing, though, but uh, that's what they're talking about. Yeah, but yeah. we have been getting a lot of feedback saying that they want us to do another... Uh, Jeopardy. The show was great. Yeah, Jeff exactly. Jeopardy. Jeff Beardy, yeah. So maybe we'll do that. But we don't need to have yeah, uh, right, Sean right, and Julian right, yeah. listen to us ramble about that stupid stuff. We can talk about that off air. Yeah. Um, but thanks to everyone. Uh, thanks to uh, our guests, uh, Jude, uh, Sean McElhenney, and Julian Schrago. I hope I got that, that right. 
And, almost. Oh, Shrego. Shrego. So, okay, Shrego. Almost. Almost. Yeah. Well, almost is, is usually what I'm, when it comes to pronunciation. pretty good for us. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, to everyone else listening, we will see you next week. And uh, until then, so long. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard and seen from again, 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 again. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard and seen from again, 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 again.